let's introduce binary classification. So we are going to focus on binary classification as a case study in order to build up our intuition about machine learning. So there are many interesting machine learning problems, but we're just focused entirely on binary classification in this class. So binary classification is closely related to binary hypothesis testing, which we covered in an earlier chapter. The difference is that we do not have conditional probability models given to us in advance for the observation. So in binary hypothesis testing, we knew the conditional models or likelihoods, and we could use those to form our decision rule. Here, we don't have them in advance. What we do have is a data set consisting of labeled examples. So we have an idea of what we should be doing. So while we can use these examples to estimate a probability model, this isn't necessarily the best thing to do. So the best thing that we want to do is just design a good decision rule to classify new examples. We don't necessarily need a probability model to do that. Well, let's look at some examples. One is we want to design a classifier for cat and dog images, and you'll do this in your project. Another is you want to classify MRI images as either having malignant or benign tumors. And third, maybe you have measured a fruit passing along a conveyor belt in a factory and you want to sort it into quality bins. Okay, so here's the basic framework. For binary classification, we're going to have a few simple ingredients and a little bit different notation. So we're going to have a data set consisting of a collection of labeled examples, okay? So these labeled examples are of the form x vector i, y i, for i going from one to n. So x vector is the d-dimensional vector of features, and um, y is either plus one or minus one, that's the label. So the one departure from our previous notation is before we were trying to predict zero or one, using y vector, but now we have x vector trying to predict plus or minus. Okay, so here's an example data set in two dimensions. So I have these pluses and minuses, and what I'd like to do is come up with a rule for distinguishing where I should say plus and where I should say minus. So I need a classifier, which is really a decision rule, and we'll call it d with input x vector, that outputs either plus one or minus one for any possible input. So we need to divide up this space into plus and minus regions. Here's one way of doing it. We're gonna measure performance using the error rate, and we can relate that to probability of error just by thinking of it as the fraction of misclassified points or examples, okay? So in this case, we have 20 examples, and we can see that four of them have been misclassified. Here are the four. And so the error rate is four out of 20, which is 20%. Recall from the previous video that we need to actually split our data set into a training data set and a test data set. Okay, so we're gonna randomly take all of the pairs, the feature vectors and their labels, so we have N of them, and we're gonna take some fraction of them call them the training data set going from one up to n train. Okay. And then we're going to take the remaining part of the data set and call that the test data set from one up to n test. Okay. So n train plus n test is just equal to n. Okay. So here in this visualization, those are going to be the training data set and the green points are going to be the test data. And we'll stick with this throughout the um, video. So this training data is going to be used to um, design our decision rule, okay? So we wanna come up with a good decision rule using only the training data. We can also select and tune the parameters using the training data. The test data is there for us to mimic what's happening in the real world. So for us to estimate the real world error performance or error rate, and it cannot be used for parameter tuning or any kind of decision rule um, optimization. Okay, and as I said before, n train plus n test is n.
Okay, so one thing that we're gonna need um, throughout this video is a way to count errors. So this is just some formal definition. We're gonna do everything visually, but this function g error, what it does is it takes in your decisions and the true labels, and when they're uh, not equal, it says one, and when they're equal, it says zero. So when they're not equal, we've misclassified that point, and when we, um, they're equal, we've correctly classified it. So the training error rate is the fraction of misclassified training examples. So this error rate is just the number of misclassified training examples divided by the total number of training examples. Okay, so if we were to write this formally, we would be dividing by n train and summing up over the entire data set this g error function with our decision rule applied to the training data versus the training labels. We're going to do exactly the same thing to calculate the test error rate, except we're going to do it on the test example. So we're going to run from um, 1 to n test, okay? And we're taking the fraction of misclassified test examples. So writing that is 1 over n test, summing from 1 to n test um, g error of the test data set passed through the decision rule versus y test. We can always get 0% training error by memorizing or equivalently just using a complex decision rule. Um, but this may not give us low test error rate. Okay, so we can always just memorize the training data, but that doesn't always work very well. And we'll see some examples. Uh, so here is a nearest neighbor classifier. This is our first classifier. It's a very simple idea. So all it says is take um, your training data and form a dictionary. And what you're gonna do is every time you're given a vector as an input, you look through that dictionary to see which training example is the closest and output its label. Okay, so I say my decision is the label of the closest point and the cl this I closest is the index of the closest point. So what I mean is it's the point which distance is equal to the minimum distance across the entire training data set. Okay, and you can break ties as you like. Um, that's not really critical. You can just take the first point that meets the criteria. And remember that this double bar just means length of the vector. So here I have 12 training uh, points, zero training errors because all the training points will be correctly classified. And I put my test data there and I see how many test points are misclassified, just this one. So my test error rate is one over eight, 12.5%. We could also come up with another kind of nearest neighbor classifier that looks at K examples and tries to find the k closest training examples to where my input vector and then take the majority vote among those labels to give my guess. Okay, so we haven't shown that here and that'll just be um, something for you to consider in a later course. Another idea, which is a we're going to call the closest average classifier, is just going to take the data sets and compute the conditional sample means of the training data. So compute the mean vectors of the training data for the cases where y is plus one and for where y is minus one. And then you're just going to pick the label for which you land closer to the mean vector, okay? So let's be a little more formal. We'll say n train plus. Those are all of the training examples. That's the number of training examples where yi is plus. And this is the number of training examples where yi is minus. Okay, so we can see that the indices of the tra positive training points are just those ones where the label is plus, and the indices of the minus training labels are those where the index is, uh, points to a label which is minus. Okay, so to calculate the means, I just sum up over L plus here the uh, training data, and then I see I get this big blue point here. And for mu minus, I just sum up over the negative examples and I see I get this red circle here. Okay, so the closest average classifier just sees which of these two mean vectors is closer. If the positive mean vector is closer, I say positive. If the negative mean vector is closer, I say negative. So in this example, I'll get a decision boundary that looks like this. It's a linear classifier. I'm going to make three training mistakes 
So my training error rate is going to be in this example, three over 12, which is 25%. And I'm going to have my test data come in. I have eight points. I'm going to make two errors on my training data, sorry, on my test data. And that's going to be a test error rate of two over eight, which is 25%. Let's look at something a little bit more complicated. So the linear discriminant analysis method just assumes that for a given label, let's say positive, the input vector is Gaussian. It's a Gaussian vector. And so it has a mean vector, in this case, mu positive, and it has a covariance matrix. Let's call it sigma in bold. So what we can do is estimate these parameters, mu plus and mu minus, as well as the covariance matrix sigma, and then use the ML rule. Okay, so we're gonna define the number of positive and negative training examples, the indices of those training examples, and the means like we did on the previous slide. We can calculate the covariance matrix for positive examples like this. So the sample covariance matrix for positive examples. We can do the same thing um, for negative examples. We just calculate the sample covariance for negative examples. And then because we believe these two things to be the same, we're going to pool these estimates as we did in the scalar case a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna combine these estimates into a single estimate of my covariance matrix, sigma hat. So then I'm gonna have two different um, likelihoods. So I'm gonna have this Gaussian vector likelihood for when y is positive, where I have the positive mean mu hat plus, and I have the sample covariance matrix like I have there. And I'm going to have another conditional model where I have y is minus, and so I use mu hat minus, okay? So these, this is my two conditional models, which are Gaussian. Okay, well, all we need to do now is apply the ML rule. And the one thing we need to do is simplify it a little bit because if we apply it directly, the values in the exponent will get really small and we'll run into numerical issues. So what we're gonna do is simplify it a little bit. So I'm gonna write the terms in the exponent. So I've already canceled out the constants in front and we're just writing an equivalent rule here by opening up the exponent, which I got by taking logs. Now I'm gonna multiply through all of these uh, terms, okay? So I'm getting, I multiplied these vectors by these matrices, and I'm gonna notice here that I have two terms that are the same. I'm gonna cross them out, and I'm just gonna group terms by those that depend on x here, and those that are just constants on the left-hand side. So I just added them, subtracted as I needed to, and it turns out this is a linear classifier. So I just have a vector times x being compared to a constant. I can rewrite this in the following form, and this is the form of the LDA classifier. So it's really treating the data as if it's Gaussian with the same covariance matrix and different mean vectors. We can think of the closest average classifier as a special case where I assumed that I had sigma is equal to the identity matrix. So looking at this in terms of our example data, I had 12 training points. Here's my decision boundary. I had one training error. So that's gonna be 8.3%. And I'm going to have eight test points. My test error is again going to be two. So my test error rate is two over eight. That's 25%. Okay, this is a linear classifier. You can see a linear decision boundary. And we could have assumed that the covariance matrices were different we get a more complex decision rule, which would have some curvature, and that would be called quadratic discriminant analysis. So looking ahead, modern approaches to binary classification often rely on um, what I'll call uh, large-scale optimization techniques. So what they're trying to do is um, basically use our data set to pick the parameters of decision rules that are drawn from much richer families of functions. So here we are looking at pretty simple functions, but you could consider something like, for instance, neural networks. So neural networks um, use gradient descent as an optimization technique to set the weights of what we'll call individual units. And these units are kind of loosely based on cartoon models of biological neurons. Okay, so here's a picture of a neuron. You can kind of imagine this neuron as having a bunch of inputs that get weighted and compared to some threshold, um, which could be a nonlinearity. Okay, 
And so deep learning is something that has really got a lot of attention and um, application in the last uh, few years. And what it's doing is just using many layers of these units to deal with massive data sets, and it's a bit beyond our scope. What we can look at is this perceptron classifier, which dates back to the 1950s. So although gradient descent is beyond the scope of this particular class, what we're going to do is implement a very simple um, neural network, really just one artificial neuron, and this is just called the perceptron, okay? So the way that it looks is that we sum up our inputs plus a constant and compare to a threshold. So if we end up greater than or equal to zero, in this weighted sum, we say plus one, otherwise we say minus one. So we have to train the weights of this neuron, which we start out by initializing this vector of weights to all zeros. Then we run over the training set in this loop and we guess the a label of the current position, okay? And note that this particular linear operation, which I've written here, is really just the constant B0 plus the weighted sum of the input coordinates, okay? Just a compact way of writing it. And I just update these weights according to the following rule, okay? So if my guess is wrong, meaning that Y train I is not equal to Y temp, this will update the weights and it'll do so using this R, which we call the learning rate. And it just needs to be between zero and one. Let me end the loop. So once we've finished training the weights B, we're gonna use them for a linear classification. Okay, specifically what we're gonna do for this perceptron rule is say plus one if B transpose times one X vector is greater than or equal to zero and minus one otherwise. And this B vector are just the trained weights. So in this particular example, I ran that algorithm in one particular order with learning rate 0.5. This is what I got. I got this boundary. I made two errors in the training data set. Okay, so that's two out of 12. That's 16.7%. And then for the test data, I got two errors. Okay, and that left me with a test error rate of two over eight, which is 25%. Okay. The one thing I wanna just end with here is that this, these illustrations I had on the right are very simple 2D examples, and you shouldn't try to draw out some conclusion that say the nearest neighbor rule was better in general just because it did better in this particular data set on the test error. Depending on your scenario, any one of these decision rules might give you the best performance. It's something you have to just try out and see.